My guest on the dojo today is a staple of the modern and retro gaming communities. He provides unrivaled technical analysis and reviews of games on YouTube and is an ever approachable personality within gaming circles. Now moving into Shenmue folklore, he has produced five extremely well detailed videos across all three Shenmue games and is arguably most famous for releasing the footage of the now cancelled Shenmue remake via Digital Foundry in 2018. My guest today is Digital Foundry host John Linneman. So, John, welcome to the dojo on this fine Thursday evening. How are you doing? I'm doing quite wonderful. It's a blustery day, quite rainy um, after, you know, a little bit of snow in the morning or sort of felt that way. You know, <laughs> We haven't had snow here, but we've had the typical UK grey, dreary autumn rain. It's that time of the year. It is, but we're getting into Christmas, which I consider Shenmue season, so it's appropriate. It is. I agree. So, first and foremost, I do this with everybody, is um, can you sort of give me a tour of your gaming history and how you sort of came to be a part of the industry and then later on Digital Foundry itself? Oh, sure. Um, I'll keep it relatively brief, but, you know, for me, uh, it does kind of start with the Atari VCS being the first actual console I had. And it was a hand-me-down that I played on a black and white TV. Um... And then, you know, I started to get some of the other systems from there. The first one I purchased with my own money, by the way, was the Game Boy. Uh, very proud of that, of course. And then, um, so I was really into to 8 and 16-bit console gaming at the time. And then I discovered the world of personal computers, which happened a bit later for me compared to like in the UK, I suppose, where you had all the 8-bit micros kind of taking off. It wasn't quite like that in the U.S., um, so my first PC was like an IBM 8086 based machine, a personal system too. Oh yeah. Which was not an amazing machine, but there was some interesting stuff on there. But then when I got a 486 DX266, that's when I really got into the world of PC games. And, you know, I kind of, I had a few years where I was just mostly playing PC games. And then I guess at some point around 97, if I recall, I, I just had this urge to get back into consoles and that's when i finally picked up the saturn so i wasn't on the saturn train from day one i kind of let that slide for a little bit but i jumped back in then picked up that and a playstation as well uh played a lot of those got super hyped for the dreamcast and you know bought the dreamcast on day one and basically ever since then every new console that would come out i was pretty much there day one so or at least as close to day one as possible given that the pre-order situa situations could get out of hand. Yeah, well, especially the recent pre-orders with PlayStation and Xbox, which you still can't get. You know, it, it's really not that different from, like, the Wii situation. No, that's to true. To be honest, like, it was the same. The, the Wii was difficult to get for, like, a year, at least. So it's kind of similar. Um, and, you know, the demand for even, like, the PlayStation 2 when that launched... I mean, I lined up outside of Best Buy with some friends and camped out. <laughs> so that's what people were doing back then. It was, it was crazy. But um, so, yeah, I was really just really into that stuff. And I did uh, PC work or IT work and programming, all kinds of stuff for my job in the car industry. Uh, but then uh, my wife, who is French, wanted to move back to Europe in 2013. And so I quit my job over there and I just happened to see Mr. Richard Ledbetter post a, the equivalent of a help wanted sign uh, for Digital Foundry. And I applied there and got to work with him. And then the rest is kind of history from there. You know, it was mostly an article driven site at the time. And then in 2015, we, we did the, uh, the so-called pivot to video as they call it, which was my true calling. Cause I really like making videos. So, and then, yeah, we've just been kind of building on that ever since. Mm -hmm build build and build and build and it's taken off digital foundry i mean for people who don't know who digital foundry are make sure you check them out over on youtube if you want full technical analysis reviews on games current games retro games they are the place to be quite frankly yeah the modern stuff is very focused on tech but for the retro stuff i try to do a little bit more go beyond that so that's very all-encompassing if you will 
Yeah, definitely. And I'd recommend the DF retro stuff, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit later. So segueing into the Dreamcast and, and Shenmue itself, obviously you've got your Dreamcast. When did you first come across Shenmue and how did you come across it? So it all c- comes back to, I guess, just becoming aware of the Dreamcast in general in, tw- uh, what is it, 1998? Uh, I was a member of a forum at the time that was called Sega Blast City. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. I've but, heard of it, yeah. Uh, I was on there. That was actually the first like gaming forum I was a member of, followed by the Gaming Age forums right after that. Um, and, you know, at the time, you could actually get videos on the internet. They were small, very low quality, but I, I was getting like these little tiny postage stamp size videos of Dreamcast stuff. Sonic Adventure, of course. And then there was the... Uh, the Project Berkeley stuff that came out. So I remember when, when Dreamcast launched in Japan, uh, Virtue Fighter 3, which was super hype for me, of course. I love Virtue Fighter 3 in the arcade. That came with a disc for Project Berkeley, which would become Shenmue, and basically it presented itself as, hey, we're going to make an RPG where the combat system is like Virtue Fighter. I mean, that's kind of what, what the pitch was, right? Yeah. And just just seeing that like got my imagination going wild. And of course, you know, they announced more, they do that whole Shenmue event with Yu Suzuki where they like revealed a lot of the gameplay and all these cool trailers showing off like the magic weather system. And I actually, in 1999, I had burned a CD, a CDR just called like Shenmue stuff. And it was a collection of all the videos, trailers, music, soundtracks, screenshots, everything I could find on that. Uh, just jammed in there on top of, you know, the initial issues of the Dreamcast magazine in North America. There was like an initial pre-launch uh, issue that came out that I got in a shop that had a huge spread on Shenmue. And I just remember seeing those visuals and, you know, you, you see it now and, and obviously you can see the flaws. But to my eye, it was like, wow, they're actually doing characters that look not far off from the CG renders that we saw in like PlayStation games, like pre-rendered stuff, but it's like in the game and there's a giant world to explore. And, you know, without even knowing what the game would become, it just kind of, you know, just the concept was unbelievable at the time. You know what I mean? I mean, of course you're, you're doing this, so (laughs) you know what I mean? Like it had an allure to it that was really, really exciting and unlike anything else that had ever come before. And of course, just knowing it was AM2 and Yu Suzuki trying to do this, you know, they had been one of those teams that had been known for redefining what games can be for years. So, yeah, exciting times. Yeah, definitely. And I, I remember as a kid, a friend of mine came up to me in school with the UK Dreamcast magazine. He's like, you've got to see this. You've got to see this. And I think that's exactly <laughs> it's what in it is because it's the way it looked, I mean, with all due respect to games at the time, there was nothing anywhere near it in terms of its graphical presentation, let alone when you actually played the game, you look at the soundtrack, you look at the the, the um, cutscenes and everything together. It was, in my, in my words, I'd argue it's probably the first AAA title. Yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. And the thing, the thing about those early pre-release shots and trailers, though, is that inevitably the game would change visually. Yeah. Uh, and content would change and things got a little bit muddied in a way that, you know, kind of actually disappointed me initially when I played it because like there was the, the face demos of course, that were being shown, which were real time technically, but not in game. Uh, and then there was also the shots from areas that would be in Shenmue too. Uh, and all this, all these characters and all the stuff that you saw early on. And then it kind of turned out that, well, no, it's not, actually going to be all that in Shenmue 1 uh, but still and sort of as, as a segue question I suppose do you think that that in some respects harmed the Shenmue franchise in sort of gamers eyes because you didn't necessarily get what was advertised on the tin and also because of the pacing of Shenmue 1 itself that's tricky to say in relation to how many units of the Dreamcast were out there I mean Shenmue sold pretty well right like it's not like it didn't do well I just think it was kind of um, just the fact that it was tied to a system that was only a moderate success kind of limited its potential at the time. Uh, and I do, I do think that some of the slow pacing maybe wasn't to everyone's taste. 
uh, for me, it was kind of natural in the end because uh, I had been, you know, as I mentioned, I was into PC games in the early and mid nineties. And so yeah. graphic adventures were part of that. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And I didn't realize it at first in the pre-release stage, but once I actually played it, uh, it's like, wait a minute, this is kind of like an evolution of a graphic adventure, which was awesome. So, <laughs> But again, not for everybody necessarily. You look at Sega's other titles at the time. You're talking about some of their arcade big hitters. Crazy Taxi, obviously, is a big one in that. You got your Sonic Adventure, which was fantastic. You got your Virtual Fighter. So it was completely it was sort of left field for Sega at the time in terms of what they were putting out. But that was Sega at the time. They put anything and everything out. When you look at the repertoire they've got on that console, it's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. So the the difficulty with Shenmue, I guess, just comes down to the fact that it was launched on Dreamcast. It was a little bit slow paced and the budget was really high. And yeah. also it did have development difficulties, right? Yeah. Like it doesn't seem crazy now, but at the time, you know, the amount of time it took to develop and, all the permutations it went through, it was not uh, an easy time for them, I'd imagine. No, I mean, when you talk about, obviously, we've got the Sega Saturn footage, we know it was in some iteration on there, and I really want that build. I don't think we'll ever find it, but I want it. And then it obviously got transferred to the Dreamcast, and then the rest is the rest is history, shall we say. But do you, sort of moving into the games themselves and playing them, do you, do you have a favorite out of the original two games or, or even if you want to include Shenmue 3 in that, by all means? I think I'm going to have to go with Shenmue 1. Even though I think that there's parts of Shenmue 2 especially that I love the most, like uh, the experience of working your way through Shenmue 2, especially in the latter half, that was really exciting at the time. You know, scaling the the skyscraper, reaching the top, and then that that hard cut to that very peaceful village and the walk. And you know, that's a very special thing, but there's something about that wintry snowy atmosphere of Shenmue one, just it's bumbling around that little town that I really just, I love, I look back on it in such a positive way. And the thing is, is at the time I did love it, but I remember actually being a little bit disappointed at the small scope of it because on paper, it seemed like you're exploring a huge world, but then when you actually play it, it's not, that big right it's just a few little areas but for coming from the perspective of 2021 where i am now sick and tired of open world games uh with nothing to say uh i i've grown to appreciate even more that very focused design of shenmue like yes it's a small area but that area is very lovingly crafted and you get to know it well and yeah. it just ends up sticking with you in a way. They they did such a great job of just building an immersive and memorable environment. And I love that. Yeah, it feels like home. And you are right yeah. when, when you talk about open world games these days. They are big and vast and you know, huge in scale. But I don't, Shenmue feels lived in. That's the, the way I can put it. Exactly. That's the thing. It, it feels lived in. Uh, you don't get that in, in a lot of open world games today. No, and a personal thing I would love is open world games to expand inwards to do what Shenmue was doing back in the, in the late 90s, early noughties and really focus in on those small areas and pack them full so they just feel feel alive. That's the way I'd put it. Yeah, I think I think this is something in a different genre, but this is what I've loved about some of the Deus Ex games, for yeah. instance, is, you know, they have these hubs and these places that you spend a lot of time in, but they're always very... They're relatively small, but they're so packed with detail. And I think just having a moderately sized, but super detailed environment that's so much more engaging to explore is that's kind of the way to go for me, at least. And I know I agree, I, I agree with you, I think, because, but then I think we're probably cut from the same cloth a little bit in the way we yeah. view our games and the way we grew up with, with consoles going all the way back. So all right, you've played Shenmue 2, you got to the infamous cave scene where it's all about to kick off and then it all just stops. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How, I mean, how did you feel at the time thinking, obviously at that point, we didn't know that we were going to have a nigh on 20 year wait between games? Yeah, that's the thing is um, we didn't know that. And I just remember, fin I remember thinking that that whole ending sequence was just so well done and it really pulled me in. Um, and this was, 
I was really starting to get into some narrative driven games at the time. Right. Yeah. You know, on, on all platforms, you know, I was really big into the metal gear solid stuff, silent Hill series at the time, you know, that's when I was really discovering those types of games. And of course, Shenmue moves right there alongside them. Uh, and yeah, it's, it was super well done. And, you know, like any, like any film or game that has sort of a cliffhanger ending, you're always like, well, you know, hopefully it'll continue, but if not, you know, you just kind of live with it. And yeah, it just, <laughs> I kind of lost hope that, that there would ever be any attempt to continue that story. Yeah. And then, I mean, they've tried to revive the franchise a few times. If I'm sure you remember the Shenmue online stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm glad that didn't work out to be honest. No, yeah. I think I'm with you on that one in that I get the thought behind it. But at the same time, it, with, with all due respect, it wasn't what the fan base wanted, in my opinion. No, absolutely not. And you look back at the sort of Shenmue and budgets now and the rest of it, 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 hindsight's a wonderful thing, but they could have, in theory, put that money towards a Shenmue 3 at the time and they would recoup their costs. Uh, yeah, I just think that there's there does seem to be something going with with just between Sega, the people that worked on Shenmue at the time, like... I feel like the development was rather traumatic <laughs> for a lot of people. <laughs> I've heard from some of the staff that had worked on those games back in the day that uh, it was not a fun ride for them. So not everybody feels that way, but I definitely get the impression that it was so difficult that I think just bringing it up just recalls a time that they don't want to get into. And I suspect that's why we never saw it sort of reemerge. It really took, Yu Suzuki and you know partners <laughs> to bring it back like they had to really want to bring it back I think to make it happen yeah they did I mean the narrative from Sega back in the sort of late noughts early 2010 time was they you know they weren't interested in doing it and then things pick up the pacing picks up the campaigns pick up from the community groups and we fast forward to 2015 um, and the build up to E3 so did you have any sort of inclination around that that e3 the e3 of dreams as some people call it when obviously you've got final <laughs> fantasy 7 you got uh last guardian which is one of my favorite ps4 titles ever i love that game yeah me too it's so good so so well done yep. uh, and shenmue 3 did, was there any inclination f from from you guys or anything that it was going to come back yes yeah i had, i had heard to the grapevine that that was something in the cards so uh and in fact um what was it? I, I guess it wasn't, nothing was set in stone, but I had heard enough rumors like within a month or so of E3, but you know how those things go, right? Yeah. Even when you hear that, at least for me, I was extremely skeptical. Yeah. Uh, I was just like, I mean, that would be cool if that happened, but I just didn't fully believe that it was possible. Uh, so when it did actually happen, I mean, the way they did it, I know some people take issue with the whole Kickstarter approach and I can definitely see that, but it was kind of a masterclass in how they unveiled it. I think uh, it, it really, <laughs> it really fed into the sort of the hype of it returning and it was just kind of a, a really cool moment to see. So, and the infamous forklift tweet from Yu Suzuki, which I know for having space oh, yeah. around the project <laughs> they were not happy about that coming out <laughs> yeah but what are you gonna do right like <laughs> wow well, yeah and i know and for the community it was almost taken as a you need to watch this e3 i think i think they pulled it off very well in the end yeah i think so i mean we can talk about the kickstarter and some of the challenges around it i think in terms of the communication that was around who was funding what and and the rest of it but the fact that they walked out without any real leaks about it barring a forklift tweet but unless you're a Shenmue fan you're not going to know what that is um it was kept really quiet and I think the element of surprise of disbelief that it actually happened the impact of that well it still sends shivers down my spine now yeah I agree and perhaps that was you know that was one of the most exciting moments for Shenmue 3 I think that initial reveal that was just super well done but then obviously you know <laughs> years of issues would follow but to be honest everything that happened afterward which I'm sure we'll discuss I kind of expected 
<laughs> especially given that they were essentially announcing the Kickstarter 2015. You're like, oh, okay, so that's that's where this is. Okay, so, so let's segue into that then in terms of the project itself. The Kickstarter has been announced. It's been a success. It's you know it's raised millions of dollars, broken all sorts of records. What what were your thoughts on sort of the, the project moving forward in terms of obviously, A, it got delayed a fair few times, which I, let's be honest, that, um, they were never going to turn that around in, in two and a bit years to get a Shenmue game on the shelf. I think most people assumed there would be a delay of some description. And then secondly, I think, Another issue was the epic deal, which caused a bit of a ruckus in the media. But what was your th- sort of thoughts on the development process and the challenges they had? Um, I would say just, you know, knowing what I know about modern development through talking with so many developers over the years, uh, I kind of anticipated that they would face a lot of challenges, especially given that the size of the team they assembled and the fact that Yu Suzuki had kind of been away from game development for a while, things had changed, right? Like just the way things are made has changed so dramatically. And you can tell even from the finished title that he kind of made this, like the team kind of created this game almost in, in a way that's very reminiscent of the Dreamcast era. And I can I can definitely see that some of the decisions made in regards to certain things were very, I would say, outdated in a way. And it, you can definitely tell that they were probably struggling to get where they wanted to be. But at the same time, you know, the introduction of those modern tools like Unreal Engine, of course, are that's exactly what made it possible within a more limited budget. I mean, Yu Suzuki was used to working in the past with like Sega and like he was like one of their top teams working with, you know, he had access to insane resources. I mean, when they were developed those arcade games, pretty much like, well, we want to make this board. Let's go get the engineering talent and spend (laughs) the money to like just make brand new hardware and they would do it. Uh, That's obviously not going to fly when you're doing sort of an independent Kickstarter project like this, right? Like the resources just aren't there. Uh, And I knew they would have to make that up through the more modern tools. And they did, but obviously with some of those reveals, there was definitely plenty of issues with, you know, the character models not looking quite right. Yeah. Uh, Some of the animations being very stilted. And I actually kind of felt you could almost see this clash of style where like, the way things were modeled kind of reminded me of Dreamcast era, but then they're using like modern Unreal Engine material properties and other things. And you get this strange juxtaposition of techniques that don't really go together that well. Um, Thankfully, while it's not perfect, I think the final game dramatically improved in all of those areas. And they, they really, really got things looking a lot better. Even if you can still kind of feel the budget limitations. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, this whole steam to Epic thing, honestly, to be, for me personally, none of that stuff really offended me. <laughs> I, mean, I really don't <laughs> care like where it goes and anymore as far as which platform. Uh, it, and I'd say for them to have done that, it's pretty clear that they needed that support from Epic. They needed that money and yeah, I can respect that. So it's kind of like, okay they did what they had to do to survive and um that's probably for the better yeah because we um, imagine i know that had they got the project say it was two million at the kickstarter we'd have got a telltale games style game which no disrespect to those styles of games but i think a lot of shenmue fans would have been disappointed had it been something like that you know beyond that what was interesting about the development process before we knew that much is i really wasn't sure what they were going to try to do because again games had changed a lot since Mm. shinmu was made and if i was initially actually a little concerned that they would essentially try to um be as impactful today as they were back in like 1999 yeah and it's pretty clear they wouldn't have had the budget to make that happen i'm like oh man if they if they try to go too ambitious here with this pitch it's just not going to work and they didn't though in the end i mean they they basically made (laughs) another dreamcast game in terms of the overall scope of what the game is i mean it plays a lot like the originals uh, for better or for worse 
and I actually found that rather charming. Yeah, as did I. It was like stepping stepping home again, I think. And <laughs> I, well, I've always referred to it as a Dreamcast game on steroids in terms of the presentation, because obviously it's modern, it's unreal, and some of the environments, obviously, you can see the visual upgrade from from the early, late 90s, early noughties to what we got, for example, in Bailu Village, which is beautiful. That's It's interesting you say that, though, because in many ways, yes, the upgrade is there, but you can also see some of the limitations. Like, they never have sequences quite as robust as the best stuff in in the Dreamcast Shenmue games. Mm. You can see that they never got as ambitious with some of their story sequences or yeah. events. Like, there's nothing on on the level of, like, the late game Shenmue 2 stuff, right? Like, no. I, I just don't think that they, they could have pulled that off with these resources. Um, and that, I think that's okay in the end. Like, what we had was still, it was limited, but still, it, it was it was a good place to be. So, another question, and obviously the Kickstarter had, they were originally going to go for three areas, Bailu Village, Niawu, and Baisha, which we know was cut. Yeah. Which is, which is a real shame, because there was early development footage of Baisha and the Tulus and everything else that were, was looking like that was going to appear. Do you think... They may be bit off more they can ch- could chew in terms of doing two to three areas. Could it? Could it? Could they have focused in on maybe sort of one area, maybe one and a half areas, for example, to sort of hone in a bit more? I, yeah, I suppose in terms, they probably ended up making the right choice. But you know, when you look at it, still, even with just two areas, I always felt that Shenmue Three did feel a little bit slight in terms mm. of content. You know, like it felt like a a part 0.5 of a full game. <laughs> it didn't quite have the same um, scope of either Shenmue 1 or 2 in that regard. Like yeah. it's probably closer to Shenmue 1, I would say, which was yeah, relatively constrained and it's kind of like that, but I could definitely feel that it was missing something. But in the end, it's better that they probably focused on what they did rather than trying to push more than they could have handled. Uh, which would either have led to even more delays, which I don't think would have been accepted at the time, no. or uh, a really buggy release. <laughs> yeah, which we did. Yeah, to be fair, let's sort of flip it on its head a little bit. It wasn't buggy generally. I know it had its issues on base PlayStation, and that's quoting quoting your video. <laughs> it has a few. Some of those things could have been fixed just by like the frame rate thing. If you just put a thirty FPS cap in as an option. Yeah, uh, it would have been totally fine, like the originals. Uh, although by having it unlocked, it ended up being kind of a blessing for uh, the PS5, since it's now like a perfect 60 FPS on there. Yeah, sil- silky smooth, on <laughs> which there, is nice. Which is yeah, which is lovely, and also l- l- sort of the scope of the project. I think doesn't get the respect. I think in some circles that it should do. I mean, they've built a game, Shenmue game. They've built a fighting system. They've you know, cut scenes. They've put everything together on what yeah you know, let's be honest is a fraction of what they were used to work with especially users Zuki was used to working with so it's crazy to think we got a product i think was as well polished as it was taking into in the, into account obviously the story limitations that we've we've just talked about yeah absolutely i agree fast forwarding into sort of e3 2019 you got your hands on a very short Shenmue 3 demo, obviously. Um, it was, I think it was a 15-minute demo at the time. Can you remember what it was like getting your hands on it for the first time and, and, and potentially in front of Yu Suzuki himself? Well, this was actually, uh, I guess, the second time I admit Mr. Suzuki. Uh, the first being at Gamescom, I guess, a year yeah. or two before that. Um, but so the first thing is, is I, I rolled up there with my buddy Audie who works with us and we were told that oh you guys you guys were late I was like what what we weren't late what actually had happened is whoever had set the appointment up for me there was some miscommunications with the timings and uh they gave me the wrong information <laughs> but knowing that and they, they figured out that wires would get crossed they're like actually okay well let's just work this out um they went back and they're like okay we can do the demo. So it ended up working out, but I was very embarrassed, <laughs> of course, you know, because it's like you're going in to play this game with Yu Suzuki sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> and then that happens. Uh, but anyway, so the thing, so what I remember most from that session is sort of playing the game 
in seeing the things that Yu Suzuki was focused on, mm. right? It's different than what I would have expected, I guess. Um, he was very focused on certain things like the timing of a QTE event, or when I was wandering around, he'd be pointing to, th to things that I don't remember exact, exactly what they were, but he'd be pointing at certain things for me to go look at and then talk about them. And it was just very peculiar things. It's like, oh, I'm looking at this beautiful scenery. And he'd be like, you know, go look at this little post here on the ground for some reason. You know, <laughs> it's just, it was very strange, like little details. Like he was very focused on very small details that, that he seemed to be very proud of. And I, I found that really kind of charming and interesting. And, you know, it, it, it did, it, I, that was the first time when I finally realized like, oh, this, this really feels like a uh, classic Shenmue in a lot of ways. And that's when I kind of realized that it was, uh, it wasn't trying to be more than Shenmue. It was trying to be Shenmue. Was that a sense of relief? For me, that was, I was a relief and I was feeling hopeful, but I also walked out of there thinking based on the demo I'd experienced and the stuff we had looked at, I was like, oh man, if, if if this was being shown to other people that weren't especially into Shenmue or, or all that familiar with the originals, I could see them walking out of there with a pretty bad impression of what they had just played Yeah, because it's so different. It was, the demo was not action packed at all. Uh, and that wasn't the point, but if that's, you know, those people, I could see them just not really getting anything out of it or understanding what's trying to be done there. And it's pretty clear at that point that this is no longer sort of a mainstream kind of project, right? This yeah. is something that was being made for fans of the original. Definitely. And it showed in the final product. And mm -hmm. you look at the some of the reactions to the initial demo, I think it, it, it did. It divided opinion massively. You had people who'd played the originals and loved them back in the day singing its praises. And I think you had a sort of a more modern outlook on it that, that slated it, to be fair. And I, you know, I don't fault them for it. I mean, it was never for everyone. It was just an interesting thing. And it sort of made me feel a little bit uh, concerned about its potential for success. Yeah, which I think is reflected a little bit, especially when you look at the final product reviews. Again, it's it's split. And even the community was split, actually, in the end on, on some of the game itself. Understandable. Actually, that... That kind of gets into the whole thing. What do you want from Shenmue? It had yeah. taken so long to get the game to this point. I think it, Shenmue was almost like this legendary thing, almost intangible to some people. And also just from talking to other fans of the series, I found that some of the things that people loved about Shenmue 1 and 2 are completely different from the things that I loved about those games. And I, they, they, they felt rightfully so that Shenmue 3 did not service them in that regard. Right. Yeah. If those certain specific things that you loved about the originals weren't taken care of well in Shenmue 3, it would have been a disappointment. But for me, it kind of, you know, it capitalized on what I did love about them. And that's, that's fair. Cause it's, I mean, you can't please everybody at the end of the day. And it does, it does, it does have its faults. I mean, the story is light, the fighting system although I thought it was quite playable, clearly wasn't polished. It's probably the fairest thing to say, although when you get into the depth of the fighting system, I found it, some of the combos are really nice, actually. Yeah, it's such it's such a weird game in the end in that regard. Like, mm. it's, it's so hard to really judge it because there's so much baggage there. <laughs> and I, I don't think whether, if you say I love it or I hate it, I don't think either person is really wrong about that. And, you know, it's it's such a strange project in the end. Yeah. And it, it, like you said a minute ago, it feeds into the, the, the legendary status of Shenmue, I think, in some people's heads or minds that it was always going to be on this pedestal. Because I don't think they could ever have hit the heights that everybody wanted just by pure nature of the project being a Kickstarter, it was never going to happen. So there was always going to be a division, I think, it, within communities, within the media as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, obviously it's difficult for sort of a moving on to a Shenmue 4 in, in theory, which we all hope we're going to get, of course. But one thing that did emerge 
sort of as, as a side point is obviously we got Shenmue one and two sort of remastered on or re-released rather in 2018 onto um onto modern platforms. So my first question around that point is essentially obviously you reviewed the game pre-patch. Now it's all been sort of patched up and all the major issues with it have been taken care of. What are what are your thoughts of it from, uh, from on the conversion from Dreamcast to the modern platforms? Um, I would say I was generally pretty happy with it, to be honest. But it's one of those things where, you know, if you just play straight through them in that pre-patch phase, I thought it was pretty good overall. But then as you start to play through more and and start to explore some of the mini games in more depth, you do start to see that there was definitely some cracks, right? Yeah. Uh, And that's the thing about Shenmue, due to the nature of it and the fact that it has so many different types of things you can do that all often have their own bespoke interface um it can kind of uh, be better or worse depending on what specifically the player does in the game uh so i think my impression got a little bit worse in time after my initial playthrough because of that but thankfully they did sort of patch up a lot of that stuff I mean, some of the things like the arcade game stuff was really disappointing. That it didn't work very well initially, and uh, but in its current state, I think it's quite solid. I would, st- I still have this preference for playing on the original hardware, but I, I, you know, I prefer playing Shenmue 2 HD over, say, the Xbox version, yeah. which I'm not super fond of for numerous reasons. So it is better than that, I think, um, but. The thing is, is it's just, we know that the the development time on this was really short. And, and I think it was just, I think they did the best they could given the circumstances. Yeah. And sort of moving into the circumstances um, and you've sort of gone down in Shenmue community folklore for this is obviously Digital Foundry released the the video of the council remake, um, which I must say, I was, I'm gutted it never happened. Um as a, but I mean, it's part of Shenmue history now, and obviously, and, and having it out there, I think we're better for it. But obviously, seeing that footage, um, what were your thoughts on it, and and where it could have gone? I mean, obviously, I I found that extremely interesting, of course, uh, and that's why I wanted to share it with the community in that way. Um, and I I do think there was a lot of potential there, and I would have loved to have seen what they could have done if they'd taken it to completion. Uh, because it did kind of, it straddled this line before, uh, between sort of the more modern style of rendering and then the original visuals that I thought was pretty tasteful, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you got some of the benefits of this stuff, like shadow maps and other yeah. techniques, but it didn't, but clearly, I mean, for whatever reason, I guess it was just either deemed too expensive or Sega wasn't necessarily happy with the results or it's hard to say exactly why that ended up getting canceled. Um, I haven't thought about that in a while, but you know, it's, it's just one of those things. I mean, it's cool to know that it had existed and to see that somebody was trying it, but clearly it was just a little bit too much to pull off in the end. Yeah. And I think you're probably right that, I mean, budget would probably come into it a little bit as well. We don't know. We don't know for sure. Uh, unfortunately but yeah it's just one of those things it's uh but like you say i think it's better off that we do know about it i don't think it takes anything away from what we do have no Uh, and it's neat to know that such a thing existed at one point so yeah and it and it looked like it was being put together with some real care um i mean one criticism i saw leveled at it was that it was too western in its presentation i didn't share that view but did what did you think about that um, I don't necessarily think that either, to be honest. And a lot of the asset stuff was still relatively, especially for the Shenmue 2 part, which was more unfinished. It was still mm-hmm. very much the original stuff, just tuned up a little bit. But I thought they really cleaned up some of the features really nicely in a very tasteful way. Uh, and I was really happy with the look. So, you know, I, I think there was still some polish to have been done, but I, the video is, of course, that was not even like in alpha state necessarily Mm. right so it's things were obviously still very much in development when that was made yeah and i mean i'm still like i said i'm gutted it never happened but 
hopefully one day someone might come in with a watch of cash and, <laughs> and do it but <laughs> we'll see we'll see but sort of feeding into the sort of a Shenmue remake I, I've I'm just interested have you come across the um the Shenmue Dragon and Phoenix project which some community members have decided to try and convert Shenmue 1 and 2 into Unreal and, and what are your thoughts on it if you have seen it um I have seen bits of it and I do like what they've shown off uh, I do. I think it's. Um, I'll be curious. I, I don't know enough about the state of that project, though. Uh, I've just seen some of the demonstration videos and some of the environments, like the arcade and things like that, done up in that new style. And I do think it's it's looking good. The visual style they have there is good. Um, but how much do you know about the actual like implementation of the game? What I know is they've they've literally reverse engineered the original titles from the from the PC version. Oh wow! So they've like all the animations that's all going in, all the fighting, yeah, all of that's going in. I hope they can pull this off. So uh, that's all I'll say. What they've shown so far, what I've seen at least, looks awesome. So I, I you know, but it's a huge undertaking, and I, I would not fault them if they're not able to get this finished. Uh, but I sure would love to see it. It's a yeah, and it's a small team doing it. One of them, one of the team who who's heading it up is is one of our staff members at the dojo, and um, they're ambitious, very very ambitious with it, and they're putting a lot of care and attention in, into that project. And what I've seen of of bits and pieces moving around, I do think they're on the right lines with it. But I I'd love, it. hopefully they can finish it because I think if they do, it's going to really sort of draw a line in the sand for Shenmue. It kind of reminds me of, um, in some ways, of the Black Mesa project. Yes. For Half Life, you know, that re envisioning, but it's still kind of based in the original. Like, obviously, if they're reverse engineering the original game, this is even going to be more true to the originals, but it's that same kind of feeling. And, you know, that actually did eventually see release. It took a long time, but they got there and it's awesome. So he started work on this in 2018. So it's been running a while. So everything, everything crossed. Let's let's hope, man. I, I would love to see it. Yeah, as would I. As would I. So sort of moving into the future a little bit of the franchise, we obviously got the Shenmue anime trailer a couple of weeks ago. Um, what did you think of it? Dude, I love the visual style in that, to be honest. Like, I thought it looked uh, like just awesome. It looks so good. I'm completely into it. Uh, the cinematography on the shots that they've done there, the just the, the style of the characters, the way they're drawn. It's, it feels unique, but somehow authentic in a way that kind of sh- surprised me. Yeah. And I love seeing like some of those iconic scenes, like, e- like even like the original dojo from the very first Shenmue, uh, seeing that recreated in this style. That's just, uh, it's pretty awesome. Did you think like, cause I loved it and seeing, for example, Rio's karate tournament, which is, which is a Shenmue folklore thing. Um, do you think it struck a slightly darker tone maybe in the way it was presented it's hard to i don't know i i don't i, I wouldn't necessarily say that uh it, it feels consistent enough with the originals because they 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 had their moments where they tried to have a slightly darker tone i think already yeah uh i wouldn't say that shenmue is a happy game true true <laughs> right? uh it's fairly bleak throughout in a way like there's moments of hope and i i kind of felt like the trailer did a good job with that like the color schemes like you know when you're down at the docks and you're engaging in some of the battles down there it does have that kind of dark night kind of atmosphere a lot uh yet there's still plenty of like bright brightly lit scenes that still kind of capture that atmosphere and i don't know it, it we'll have to see until the whole thing is out but i mean i guess it could be argued like the the dojo scene there again with at the beginning with his dad let's uh it looked a little bit darker outdoors than perhaps it was in the game yeah definitely but then again that one you know when they show the the snow turning to rain at the end it was nighttime and storming so even though when he first arrived in the dojo it was mid-afternoon and snowing so i don't know (laughs) it's got a lot of potential i think and hopefully brings brings new people in because i think that's the aim of it at the end of the day is to to bring new people to the franchise when is it coming out by the way uh 2022 we don't know when yet oh my gosh i'm 
I'm very excited. I will be there. I'm, I will be there. Day one, Crunchy Roll is going to be on. I think Toonami as well, and Adult Swim. I have to figure out how I can watch that. <laughs> VPN. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so cards on the table with it. Obviously, we, we know Shenmue 4 is a bit up in the air. We don't, we don't know what's happened in terms of the franchise going forward. Would you take the anime if it was successful to finish a story, or are you in the camp of firmly it must be a game? Oh, no, I, I would be perfectly okay with that, to be honest. Like, I, I would love to see the game continue, but I just don't know how we're ever going to reach the end at this point because Shenmue 3 ultimately advanced the story very little. Uh, it just didn't go very far, and I thought that was kind of interesting and probably wise given the uh, presentation limitations that if they did try to wrap it up <laughs> in Shenmue 3, they may not have been able to handle it, so to speak just yet so i don't know what what the future holds there but i would be completely okay with the story finishing up via like an animation or some other medium and judging on what we've seen it looks really really good so if they have to do it by anime if it's judging on that trailer i'm all in but i'd rather have a game yeah i mean of course i, I would rather have a game as well <laughs> we shall see now speaking of shenmue 3 and merchandise um one thing you've contributed to was an LP inlay for the Shenmue 3 LP collection through Limited Run Games. Can you sort of talk a little bit about how that sort of came about? Obviously, we know you're a massive Shenmue fan, but how when were you approached to do it? Oh, that was... Um, uh, I talked to my my good friend Alex O'Neill, uh, the Resident Evil Meister, uh, about that, actually. So he, he's working with Limited Run, and he does the, the Brave Wave stuff as well still. Oh, yeah. And uh, basically, you know, I think we had discussed that they were doing this LP and it just kind of came to like, a, hey, maybe I can write something for it, <laughs> you know, because he also knew I was a big fan of the series and he is also a huge fan of the series. So it just kind of worked out. And I was really happy to write something for it because obviously, you know, the music of that series has always meant a lot to me as well. Uh, so it just it was a natural fit. And I would urge anybody who's got the LP set who hasn't opened it up, read John's um, um, written piece in there. It's very, it's very heartfelt, especially around, as you say, the music, which is a massive part of the, of the franchise in yeah. itself. It's, yeah, read it. I was very, I was very happy to hear that um, Yu Suzuki himself was very touched by that essay so he quite enjoyed it he sent me a nice note about it so that was really cool yeah fantastic so i'm gonna move us a little bit away from shenmue because what you are mostly known for and if you haven't seen digital foundry i swear you're living under a rock these days because it's going from strength to strength can you talk talk to me about sort of digital foundry and sort of the process that you guys go through from an idea to then getting a video out there because I, with all due respect, I don't think people quite understand the work you go through to get something out onto YouTube as quickly as you guys do. Well, I mean, obviously this, from video to video, it varies a lot depending on the depth and breadth required for the topic. Right. Like say, uh, you know, there's some, we, we, ha we kind of have different tiers of videos we produce. Uh, there's the quick ones that can be done in a day or two where it's just like covering one or two versions of a game. Uh, the game itself is not especially massive in scope. And, you know, you can just communicate the info to the community, share your thoughts on it, and that's pretty easy to put together. But the more complex ones, especially in the retro area, that requires so much more work. Uh, obviously, you know, it starts with a lot of... Um, I, I like I'll talk through like a DF retro project because that's those are my favorite. Yeah, but please. basically it always starts with the with an inspiration. It's like what I want to do, just based on stuff I'm doing in my free time, uh, usually. And then I sit down and the first thing I do is just play and capture the heck out of those games. So whatever games I'm planning to cover, I just play them, and I capture my session. So by doing that essentially you you remember the game you know it kind of informs a lot about what you want to say and you have your b-roll uh and then it gets into like the planning phase where essentially you're coming up with like the outline of what you want to say what kind of episode you want to make in that you know i start writing at that point but i don't usually just do the script in one go it's kind of like you, you start doing the script it's like you start with the intro and you're doing chunks and pieces and trying to build it as you go 
because then from there it starts, you know, it goes into like filming B roll where, you know, you want to get product shots and, you know, just getting those, like all the different shots you get film on screen. Like for me, it takes a full dedicated day just to finish that because, you know, you're setting up all the lights, you know, getting the slider out using the different cameras and trying to come up with interesting angles and interesting shots. And it just takes a lot of time and effort to get that done. Um, and then, you know, usually with DF retro, it, it often involves a lot of different games as well. So you have to capture and, and get all of those done, especially if you're doing multiple versions of a game. So you have to get all the different versions. Also for the B roll shots, I, I like to do CRT shots when possible, uh, just to add a little bit of flavor. So filming that is also tricky. Um, and then from there, it just turns into this whole thing about, you know, I'm just taking all those assets I, I have, I film myself on camera, throw it all into premiere. And I just kind of start editing in a linear fashion. And it's always kind of chunk by chunk. Like you come up with the introduction first and the intro is really important to me to get right because it kind of sets the tone for what the video is going to be. And I put a lot, I usually spend a decent amount of time just trying to get the rhythm down, like trying to say the right things, get a lot of cool shots in there, getting the music selection, right. Timing up everything, making sure it kind of like builds a little bit of hype. And the intro is like, it's pretty much designed to, you know, get you excited about what's coming, but also kind of give viewers like an idea of what's in the video, right? Like a, a quick rundown of the kinds of things you're going to see which is a pretty common tactic, I think, but I like that in these things just so you have like a quick summary of like, okay, this is the kind of stuff I'm going to see. Uh, and then just kind of go into it. And it just, it's just kind of a, a linear natural process and it does take time. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, does it? I should know and my, my projects in my free time. So I, I'm not time bound. So obviously you've got your deadlines to meet as well, which I imagine is an added pressure. Yeah, and the, it, you know, for some for the very simple D DF videos, I don't worry so much about the style. It's just like I just get the information, get the capture, slam things together, and get it done. But you know, with DF Retro, I like to give each one its own flavor as well. So obviously, I try to do some custom graphics stuff for that. Sometimes I rely on um, uh, template graphics as well. Uh, sometimes it just involves, you know, I've been dabbling in the Unreal Engine stuff for making backgrounds and other things. It's just finding stuff that works wherever you can and, and building a theme from that. It's it, there's the act of figuring that out and then actually executing it and then implementing it in the video and making it all look pretty good. And it usually has to be done within, you know, five to 10 days for a big, big DF retro. Uh, but my normal videos are done in one to four days. Usually. Wow. That's a quick turnaround for those videos. It's pretty, I'm pretty efficient at doing it now, but it can be very stressful, especially when you're dealing with a lot of different versions of a game. And when the deadlines get sharp, like the thing I hate the most is if you're testing a game and then it turns out it has some sort of problems that don't occur until late in the game. Like realistically, there's just no way to, to, to get that stuff in a video. Right. Especially if it's like, you have like eight versions of a game and apparently there's a part like eight hours into the game that has issues on all platforms or something, you know, it's just not realistic to get there. <laughs> uh, at least the Xbox makes things pretty easy in terms of the saving. Cause it does have cloud saving across that works really seamlessly. Uh, but with the way I do things on PlayStation, it's actually a lot more annoying to deal with multiple systems. So I don't like that much. <laughs> So okay then. On the flip side, what what are you, sort of your favorite parts of putting these these videos together? It's just just like a point where things start to come together, and it actually is kind of like I I like doing s certain segments when when they when you start to feel like sort of um an emotion almost yeah whether it's the intro or like just a certain segment really hits in a way, and when I myself am in, am enjoying rewatching it and tweaking the timing and it gets me excited then I, I you know then i start to feel really good about what's being done and i love those moments it, it takes time to get there and it's always nerve-wracking like every single time because every time i'm doing a new video it's it's just a new 
it's a new project. It's a blank canvas every single time. I mean, I have, you know, my toolbox of things that I can throw in there, but it's still, it sucks start, <laughs> starting from <laughs> nothing so often uh, like that. And it's a lot different from just like writing an article, like writing articles uh, can be like taking a break um, <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> Although Richard, Richard is the master of helping us on that front, I will say, because he's, he, he's really good at sort of like taking what we've written in scripts and just polishing up the, this, the, you know, the intro and the outro in a way to make it feel more like an article. Right. Yeah. So he's, he's the master of sort of editing our work into something that's a little bit more, um, readable. <laughs> and that's just part of the machine. Like we, we kind of, when it's time to get something out, we kind of work together and get it done. But in terms of the main videos, you know, most of it's done by each individual and that's, I don't know. I'm curious to see what you think, but you may have noticed. I mean, when you look at the channel, like all of our videos kind of have their own unique style. Yeah. I think, right. Like the videos I make are different from what Alex or Rich or Tom or any of them or Audi are doing. Right. Yeah. I, I'd agree with that. And actually I think that appeals because I think people can sort of latch into a particular style of video they like. I mean, I, I like your videos. I like Richard's videos are my, my favorites because I, I just, the way the things come across in those videos to me. I mean, Richard's very, very thorough in what he says. <laughs> yes, he is. Very meticulous is the word <laughs> I'd use. Absolutely. And like your videos, I, I love the technical analysis behind those videos and seeing those comparisons. So I don't know, they just, they sort of speak to me in that way. But then equally, there'd be somebody who doesn't like those sorts of things, but likes Alex's videos a bit more because they, they appeal to that side of things. I think there's a good variation there, if I'm honest, and it works really well. That's good to hear because... You know, you look at some of the bigger outlets um, and they try to have like a consistent style across every video they put out. And I just don't think I'd want to work that way. Uh, I, I think the only thing that keeps me really excited and going is just, especially for big projects in DF Retro, is just each project can have its own style. I can do what yeah. I want. Yeah. And this is some, this is actually something great about working for DF and under Richard is like, he just lets us go crazy if we want, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, he trusts us to say like, all right, you're going to do this thing or you tell him what you want to do. And then I just go off and do it. Right. Like I'm not checking with him along the way. Like, what do you think of this? Should I do this? It's more just like, well, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And you know, sometimes there's things to change, but usually not. And I don't think I could get that at if, if I wasn't doing this, I'd probably be out on my own doing, I don't know, the patreon stuff on my own <laughs> uh but like going to like a bigger more established site and working like i don't know if that would work for me just being having to conform to a certain style yeah and i think the appeal of df is apart from that you, you have your branding obviously but that's where it ends then you guys can go off and do what you like and yeah. and, and i think that that for me and it speaks to me that it, it feels just like it feels personal that's the way I put it. It feels personal. It, it is. It, it, it genuinely is like what we do and say on there. It's our, own, it's way more personal than you might ever imagine. I think, which is, it's just kind of interesting. Like DF is not large, right? Um, <laughs> there's not that many of us currently. We're the biggest we've ever been with six people. Wow. It's, you know, it's me, Richard, Alex, uh, Audie, Tom, and Will. It's crazy. And not everybody's like, Will doesn't make videos. Uh, he's, he's doing the stuff with the PC hardware and benchmarking. He provides a completely different side of DF, which is really, really awesome as well. So it kind of covers some ground that that's really all it is. It's just us six doing what we can. And we have a lot of freedom to kind of do what we want stylistically. And I appreciate that. And it shows, I mean, and it's in the success of, of DF that you've got over a million subscribers on YouTube. I mean, did you ever think that would happen when you started making these videos that you, you got millions of subscribers now? Um, that kind of snuck up on me. <laughs> it's, a little, <laughs> it's a little bit tricky. I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's like a, it's good. And I mean, it's good, but there, there's, there's sides to it that, that makes it difficult sometimes just in terms of, you know, um, 
it's easy to forget that you're dealing with with a huge community sometimes yeah and you know i've definitely had my share of putting my foot in my mouth uh, on social media and stuff and then (laughs) getting getting myself into hot water because it's like oh yeah i forgot there's a lot of people watching this stuff you know what i mean where it's just like you can't just do the things the way you may have done in the past you always have to be conscious of the fact that you have a big audience watching you know what i mean and it's yeah it's tough to keep that in mind. And the bigger you get, the more you have to close things off and be more cautious about that stuff. Yeah. I can um, appreciate and that's, that. That's been tough to learn for me because again, we all work from our homes, right? Like we're not in some office. Uh, we're just figuring this out as we go along. And you know, that means learning about this stuff as you go along <laughs> and you definitely make mistakes along the way. It, yeah and social media plays a big role in that doesn't it because you're always going to get somebody who's a bit I'm trying to think of the polite term to put it a bit a bit put out by some of the things you guys say and uh, and i think you guys deal with it really really well and i i, I it's a t- it's a tough spot because i mean i i'm in a community it's a lot smaller but we see the same things and it's it's a very tough spot to be in. So I can appreciate where you're coming from. That's the thing that I've also had to learn is, you know, just talking to other friends and folks doing this stuff as well. It's just like, when you get to these larger communities, you're never ever going to have everybody love what you're doing. No, you're true. always going to have people that are going to take pot shots or get upset about things. That's just the way it is. It's just human nature. Right. Yeah. And learning to just understand that is really important. Uh, it's not easy, but it's just, you just kind of have to accept it because that's just, you know, you can't, there's no way to make everyone happy all the time. <laughs> it's, it can't be, it really can't be done. No, it, it can't. But equally, I'm going to make a point here of saying that actually some people need to keep their mouth shut because quite frankly, some of the comments I've seen are, are, are downright rude and disrespectful, but we get it in our community but that's, that's the nature of the beast, I suppose, isn't it? And we just have to sort of dust ourselves off and carry on. Just, just got to keep going, do what you can. So, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it is, but I'm going to go on record in saying that I, a, I am a subscriber and B, I love the DF work. I love the, the care and the attention that goes into it. And if people haven't subscribed to it yet, you're clearly living under a rock. Because if you play games, you should know who DF are by now. <laughs> You say that, but you know, not everybody's into the to the nitty gritty of the tech stuff or some of the stuff. So, you know, we're we're kind of like a popular niche, maybe is the way to describe yeah, it. Maybe <laughs> I'm a sucker for it. What can I say? But I will say, you know, the, the one of the big game changers for me this year is we redid our Patreon efforts, yeah, and built a real community around that with the with the private Discord and all that, and yeah. that has been awesome. Uh, just because the folks over on the discord are just so supportive and just so friendly and nice to talk with. Uh, it really kind of made things a lot better in that sense. So I love that community. Well, for me, I love the work you guys are putting out. So I'm going to say thank you on behalf of myself and the Shenmue community, because you do a fantastic job, all of you. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you guys watched uh, the Shenmue stuff I did as well, because I think I've said it before, but you know, really df retro was born out of shenmue mm. so and it it all comes down to um the suspicion that i think it was 2016 yes that we were going to see more um shenmue 3 stuff at e3 yeah and richard proposed doing a retrospective on shenmue and i did that retrospective uh in like february or march of that year and then i sat on it for months I think I had the project saved and I had missing holes in it and it wasn't complete, but I had done most of it. Mm-hmm. And I guess we just kind of sat on it waiting for a time for it to come out. And that was the first like retro project I ever did. And then I did that really quick five minute Quake Saturn video. Oh yes. And that was the one that actually started the whole DF retro thing and it was really small, but people liked it. And then I was like, Ooh, I can put out the, the Shenmue video finally. And you know, that that was technically the second video that we put out under that branding, but it was really the first one made. Does it still hold up, by the way? <laughs> I haven't seen it in a while. No, it does. I, wa- I, I was watching it before um, a couple of days ago 
when I was sort of doing bits and pieces for tonight, I watched it and it still holds up perfectly. I love it and I'm a sucker for it. But if you haven't watched it as a Shenmue fan, watch it. It's that's you must do. Um, the coverage is excellent and you can you can tell the care and attention that's gone into that video from a from a, from a Shenmue fan at the end of the day. So my final question to close us off is um I do this with everybody, is do you have a, a message for the Shenmue community out there who are waiting for Shenmue for the anime and hopefully beyond that? Never give up hope. We never thought we'd get Shenmue 3 to begin with, and it happened. Um, so, yeah, I never believe that it's completely dead, so to speak. I mean, clearly it's not. Uh, but, yeah, just I, I would never give up hope on it brilliant thank you john so all that remains for me to say is john thank you for taking the time out of your evening to to join me on on the shenmue dojo interview series it's much appreciated oh it's been an honor my friend i absolutely enjoyed it it's been an absolute honor to have you have you on the show as, 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 as a subscriber to df and a fan of your work so thank you for coming on thank you everybody to in the community for listening to the interview series over the last sort of nearly year that this has been running now um, I'm going to take a short break from the interview series, probably into the new year. So it gives me time to rest, recuperate, get some Christmas behind me. And then we're going to kick off again in the new year. But the podcast will keep going into the new year and into Christmas as well. So thank you, everybody. And take care.